We're going to start the meeting. It is three o'clock, three o'clock here in the beautiful city of North Pike. And today, today I want to look like this. I want to look sharp. You know why? When it comes to micro optics, when it comes to the European micro optics revolution, I get more and more excited of the success stories that we are hearing. You're going to hear about the meta lenses, the meta lenses from new technologies that everybody is talking about. I can't wait. Sun, are you ready? Let's get started today. Head up this place. Join us on Monday, September 27th for the ultimate heads up on the future of head up displays. In many situations, they are lifesavers. Having a head up display in the car is a no brainer, especially with so many distractions, both useful and useless. But different kinds of head up displays are appearing in other places. They provide just the right amount of information and exactly the moment you need it, and within your field of view. Like the cockpit of an aircraft or a display of vital signs while the surgeon concentrates on exactly where to cut. In outdoor conditions, the main challenge with head-up displays is image brightness, especially in situations with a stray light or unpredictable changes in luminosity. To solve it, industry has developed many photonic solutions, from MEMS laser scanning to digital light processing. At the same time, augmented reality head-up displays are rapidly becoming more compact using waveguide technology, holographic optical elements, and the next big thing, meta surfaces. Look at this, flat optics, 50,000 times thinner than their counterpart that can enable 3D displays and even holography. Recent success stories from Wave Optics, Microsoft and Neil Technologies are just the tip of the iceberg. And on Monday, September 27, we welcome to the epic network Modersong Innovations. They are one of the key automotive system integrators being a market leader in the smart rear view mirrors. They come to share some of their challenges, so let's welcome them Epic Style. This will be a meeting of the minds, matching new developments of SHOT, NV6, FASIX, Occumented or Javil with end user needs from Automotive, Renault or Stellantis, semiconductors like ST Microelectronics or Medical with the giant Merck. And we also have a little surprise. One of the rising stars, NXRT from Vienna, is looking for epic business. They are pioneers in innovative simulations for training and educational purposes. Helicopter pilots need to prepare for the flicker vertigo phenomenon, the stroboscopic effect that occurs when some beams fall on helicopter rotor blades. It can lead to the pilot losing control NXRT is on the case with mixed reality. So whether you want to enter the new meta lenses world, or you want to provide optics, coatings, displays, or you need them for your business or leisure, do not miss this one. Join us for a heads up, Monday, 27 September at exactly 3 p.m. It is Monday, 27 September, and it is exactly 3.04. And all of us are here, all of us are here to find ways of working together. With this short video in the beginning, now you understand what this meeting is about. You are not in a webinar. You are here to find business. All of you who still didn't accept to be promoted to panelists, do it. You are here to do business and you want to participate in the conversation. A conversation that today is going to be co-chair with my partner in crime in micro-optics, Sana Pika. And we're here representing 749 fantastic members of EPIC. We all 
love you, we know each member individually. You can test us. Every time that you see it at a conference, stop any of the people from the Epic staff and ask them if they know anything about the microscopy manufacturer Opto or if they know anything about the photoresist manufacturing microresist technology. We know each member individually, we organize events, provide access to a network, help you raise capital. We have the biggest website to find a job in photonics, jobsinphotonics.com. And of course, we help you make the right decisions with the market reports that you get for free because you're a member of Epic. And today is our chapter five on the season five of the Epic Online Technology Meetings head up this place. But I would like to tell you that next Monday, pick packaging. And that's a huge market as well for Epic. You want to hear how we can help the success story for our network. Companies like Rockley Photonics are going to be there. We need to help them pick packaging next Monday. But today, head up this place and sana we are only a few days away next week on wednesday we continue our quantum meetings sana and me are quantum experts and we love these meetings atomic clocks and network synchronization is on the 6th of october the quantum technology meetings are being are being fantastic really but today Today is all about head up this place. And I would like to first of all thank the collaborators, VRAR Association, the leading association in augmented and virtual reality, DVN, the top magazine publication to bring together the automotive industry and our media partner, Photonic Views. But also, I would like to thank the companies without whom this meeting wouldn't be possible. Our sponsors today, coming all the way from the UK, Actar Technologies, Advanced Coatings. If you are looking for black coatings all the way, all the way in Israel, you had the black coatings to do to make all the absorption that you need. Aspherical, all the way from Jena, they made the aspheric and the free form optics. You're looking for a partner that can make the laser diodes and the micro optics for packaging those laser diodes. Focus Light acquired Limo, and now Focus Light can provide the entire solution. If you're looking for a semiconductor laser supplier, that does the MBE growth, all the way to provide ultimate uh, lasers to the end users, modulite all the way from Tampere, Finland. If you're looking for laser scanning solutions, there is a company in Germany that has done a fantastic job, all the way from Itzehau, Occumented has MEM space, laser scanning systems, and less MEM space, laser scanning sub-assemblies, and all the way from Sweden, South Sweden, the company of Ducat makes semiconductor equipment where you need nano imprint lithography or roll to roll solution for ramping up volume production in micro optics manufacturing of Ducat that is your partner. And finally, last but definitely not least, the company who has been leading the European micro-optics revolution all the way from Neuchatel, Switzerland, SUS Micro-Optics, developing micro-optics in low, in, in affordable reproduction, wafer level micro-optics from the solution all the way to also help you choose the right equipment. And with this sponsor being announced, I would like to announce the most important person in any micro-optics room in the entire world, Dr. Dr. Sana Pika, what's going to happen today? That's a stressful introduction, Jose. <laughs> but thank you so much for this energy and for this nice introduction. We have an amazing speaker. We hear, we hear from Motherson Innovations today, like you nicely presented, from SD, Invisix, uh, Mega One, and Shot. And we will, uh, most importantly, look at this registration list. We have over 200 companies who signed up to join these meetings from the end users going from uh, Renault, Merck, uh, and uh, from end users doing enhanced vision solutions uh, to the display technology and to the head up uh, display manufacturers. But also, uh, you know how it works with these meetings. We try to connect all the people from the supply chain. So we covered the whole supply chain from the material to the equipment and the photonic integrated circuit, the lasers, uh, the inspection and meteorology, the system integrators, but also very important part of this technology, the software, the ARVR platforms. And uh, uh, we will hear from our speakers, but. We also have EPIC members that uh, have the opportunity to share slides about their technology, like new technology who will speak about meta lenses today. Um, and we don't forget that we have also in the room the pilot line for freeform micro optics manufacturing in Europe, uh, Fabulous. And we have also the uh, market intelligence. We have also the R&D. If any of this technology is missing, a small push from the research and technology, we have it also here in the room. Uh, if, you, if one of EPIC members is missing their logo, it's only because they did not register for this meeting. So I insist on registering online. And I give you back the word, Jose, to introduce our first speaker. Thank you very much, Sana. Just to remind that it's not 
easy to organize a meeting that brings together 200 companies, but it is it's even more difficult to understand what each company does individually. So congratulations, Sana, for this fantastic, this fantastic job. This meeting is also live stream in YouTube. So you like, you're a YouTuber and you connect it from YouTube. Hello, good afternoon. If you want to get in touch with any of the participants today, all you have to do is send me an email, jose.pozo.epictas.com. If you have any question, write it in the chat and I will read it in the room. And of course, this is also valid for the people here with me in the Zoom room. Use, abuse the internal chat. Talk to each other as much as possible. It is important that you connect with the right companies today. And if after the meeting you didn't manage to get in touch with that particular person that you could have done business with, don't worry, send me an email, jose.pozo.epic-asoc.com, and I make the introduction. Let's start the meeting. And to start the meeting today, something really special. We go to the market leader on smart rear view mirrors. Mother songs. Mother song is no innovation, is the RD team pushing mother songs into continue being the market leader. And to continue being the market leader, they need epic help. And we are here to help them. Looking forward to hearing the challenges of mother song innovations. Benjamin Samson, senior technology advisor for them. Thank you for being epic and thank you for opening the epic meeting. The floor is yours. Thank you for the invitation and for the presentation. Right, so let me share my screen. Yeah, just maybe one more precision before starting. We are more a hand user than um, a head of display manufacturer. So um, let me share my screen. Maybe. So I will start by presenting the Madison Group, which is a very big group. We are one of the 21 largest um, automotive supplier globally. We are more than 150 employees on five components. We have 270 facilities in 41 countries. And we are mainly working for the automotive industry and delivering uh, any kind of parts for the, um, uh, all the automotive OEMs um, globally. So last year, we had about um, 10 billions of revenues and we are targeting um, 12 billion this year. Our main revenues come from the uh, module and polymer uh, production. So typically um, uh, bumper, dashboard. So yeah, somewhere we can integrate a head-up display. We also are very active in the wiring and harness industry um, yeah, field, which is about a quarter of our revenues. And uh, another quarter come from the uh, vision system, so it can be rear view mirror, but also cameras and uh, display um, uh, systems. And we have uh, side activities, I would say, uh, in the lighting and electronic, and also in uh, metal parts and module and, uh, and moves and some other uh, activities. Okay, so as I said, our main activities are uh, wiring, harnesses, vision system, and uh, the production of uh, big uh, modules and polymer parts. We are also active in the, um, providing light and electronic system for the automotive industry. We also deliver um, different uh, solution for the aerospace industry and the healthcare industry. And we have yeah, some uh, other uh, side activities. Uh, so we are mainly located where the um, uh, automotive car manufacturer are. So in the US, in Europe, and also in China, in India. The company started in India 40 years ago and um, grows by merge and acquisition mainly. So now we have uh, 270 uh, factories in 41 countries. So I will talk shortly about Motherson Innovation, which is a, a small group of the Motherson Group. We are in charge of the development of new product and the uh, innovation of the group and code, so to support the different companies um, which are um, in the group. Our main uh, focus or our main interest are in the sensor and HMI um, field, but we also take care of wireless charging solution uh, advanced lighting solution and what we call a, a smart surface, which are, um, I would say, seamless integrated button 
or surfaces with um, a functionality. So concerning the um, head-up display, I will present uh, several um, products that we deliver to uh, car manufacturers and also concept we presented to these car manufacturers. Um, so as this one, this is a product we deliver to Audi, which is produced by our module and polymer division. As you can see here, the head-up display is projected on the, on the windshield. And it's um, yeah, a standard solution for Audi uh, A6 and A7, if I do remember. Uh, here, you have a concept car, which we uh, developed with uh, Vistian, with the support of Vistian, and we presented to a French car manufacturer. So the, the um, concept uh, was called EB. We also um, bought uh, the front of the car. Uh, it was a concept car we developed for the CES 2018. We call that uh, the empathic cockpit because there were lots of sensors integrated in the cockpit and also so able to monitor the, the driver and also several uh, uh, display all around the, the cockpit. Here we integrate uh, augmented reality head-up display from Wear A. This is what we can see here. And here the, um, the hole with the uh, head-up display integrated. So our whole vision of the future of head-up display in the automotive industry is the following. For the moment, what we see is that the head-up display are mainly limited to the premium segment because of the, the cost of the head-up display by itself, but also uh, because of the cost of the dashboard because it's produced in very small volumes and also because of the specificity required by the windshield to project the head-up display on. And we think that uh, in the future, the head-up display will follow the trends of the automotive industry, which are the electrification of cars and the automation of cars. Uh, by electrification, we mean that um, automakers intend to produce lighter car to, to improve the efficiency of electric cars. And all parts of cars are, are affected by, by that. And so we think that the weight of the head-up display will become a key parameter for the integration, even more than the volume. Concerning the automation of cars, we see that people, driver, will drive less in cars than now. And so head-up display providing information only to the driver will be less interesting for uh, automakers. Uh, it will or it might be replaced by system able to provide um, a full interaction with all the passengers in, in the car. Yeah, that's all from our side. <laughs> Thank you so much, Thank Benjamin. Uh, now, Madison Group is a member of EPIC, right? And you know how it goes with EPIC. We have always this EPIC question to uh, ask. You showed us what you do. Uh, and what is your center of interest? And for this meeting, we want you also to tell us what can the others do for you? So you saw the supply chain we have. What, what technology would you like to challenge the audience with today? Um, I think we would be interested uh, by, I would say, a kind of head of display um, that can be uh, integrated, not only uh, in the front part of the car, but in other parts, because we really believe that um, uh, in the future, the, with the, the future of it of display will be more entertainment than information for the, for the driver. So this solution, this kind of solution can interest us. Okay, let me see if, uh, so head up displays for, for more entertainment, maybe you can, uh, um develop on that a little bit. I have already a question from uh, uh, Gerald. Uh, can, you, can you unmute Gerald and ask us directly which functional surfaces are you looking for, which is very much. Yeah, sorry, this is, this is yeah. Um, mm -hmm. 
before in the presentation, you showed briefly at one slide that you're working on functional surfaces as well for interior parts like knobs and, and, and that kind of stuff. So which particular functions are you looking at or looking for? Um, we, on that part, we, we work on, on sliders and on uh, what we call shy electronic, which is um, button hidden behind the surface and that will uh, switch on when, um, for example, the end of the driver uh, arrive next by to the, to the button. This is typically the thing we are, we are working on. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question from David. Uh, David, you can unmute and, and ask from Open Reality. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, you said that the uh, head up displays are limited to uh, high uh, level cars, but we can see uh, a significant trend in, uh, in uh, entry level cars, I would say, like the Mazda 2 that is offering uh, in series uh, the head up displays at uh, 20,000 uh, euros starting. So we can see the evolution in head up displays going uh, in a lower segment. Is it something that you see? Is it something that you expect? Or what is your view? Um, I would say that what we view for the, for, yeah, what we see for the moment is, um, of course, a lot of car manufacturer would like to include um, uh, head up display in, in their car, but the, um, the price of the system uh, is something that can, can propose to a customer. And also the price of the integration is really limiting the, um, yeah, the integration. So um, maybe, yeah, the, the medium segment can propose head-up display, but I think it will be uh, really limited to uh, yeah, some, some cars. And what, what we see also is that there um, shall I say, head-up display also get in competition with other system like uh, head-mounted system. And this system might be uh, one day adapted to the automotive industry. I think we have yet another question uh, from uh, uh, Jean Bernie. Uh, you can unmute and, and ask directly. Uh, uh, sure. Jean. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. So, so my question is the following. You, you mentioned that uh, the price of a head-up display is still expensive, and you mentioned that the, that the windshield, I mean, the, the constraint on the windshield were one of the issues. Could you develop a bit on that and explain what are these constraints? Um, I'm sorry, but I'm not, uh, yeah, uh, I would say a specialist enough on that. You should maybe ask to someone from uh, Saint-Gobain who is the yeah who produce windshield um, okay that they will be able to answer that precisely what what i what i know what yeah and what the mothers in group know is um the constraint what what we the information we have from for example from Saint-Gobain is that the constraint um, um, are so high that at the end it is not something that can be produced for the moment in a very high volume it's it's yeah it's still okay, like, um, I don't know how to say that. <laughs> Sorry. Benjamin. Benjamin, 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 what a great presentation, first of all. I loved when you said that it was kind of the polymer division, the one that uh, pushed the EB. You have here in this fantastic slide. I think that for me that was great because I want to talk to you. Uh, I'm not going to talk to you about user experience or, or, or price. I want to talk to you about materials. When it comes to, uh, to the head of this place, lots of R&D is done on the material side of the coating used, on the thin film used. I would like you to share with us a couple, a couple of challenges when it comes to the, to the coatings and when it comes to the materials that you're using in your optics. Um, um, I would say that one of the biggest a uh, challenge we met in the head-up display is to protect the head-up display from, from the sun. So uh, we, in the integration, we need to have a um, uh, big uh, plastic part that cover, or it can be in glass, but in plastic, it's much cheaper, 
uh, that cover the head-up display entrance and that protect the head-up display from uh, infrared and UV light. And if you don't have this kind of uh, covering surface, then you, you might destroy your head-up display just by exposing the head-up display to the, to the sun. So you, you are looking for a material that has to be affordable, robust, and resistive enough for the long term, mm -hmm. and at the same time, filter UV and filter, uh, filter uh, you said uh, UV and infrared. The infrared. The infrared. infrared. Uh, until what wavelength you need to protect to filter out the infrared? Uh, one micro or something like that, I guess. Yes, yeah. Yes. All right, so this is the challenge. <laughs> this is the epic challenge. Material suppliers that can actually help Mother Song and can help Epic. We, we prepared too many introductions. I have more people to introduce you, but we have a, a, a huge material supplier coming for the first time to our epic meeting. This company is well known for their impact in the medical market, but also they are a huge company offering materials also for the electronic sector. We have somebody from Merck in the room, correct? Mark Govel, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you for welcoming me. Mark, you are thank a, you for Mark from Merck, you are one of the top <laughs> companies in this sector. I really want to know what brought you to this meeting. You told me already in private you are looking for the role of your materials in optics. Could you disclose this more? I would love a, a collaboration between Mother Song and Merck. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you mentioned that, uh, of course, our company is well known for pharmaceutical applications and things, but but we're also the, the world leader in liquid crystals. Um, so we, we do have a wide portfolio of special optical materials. Uh, we, 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 we do have um, a wide range of liquid crystal materials, high biorefringent materials. We have a portfolio of reactive liquid crystal materials where you can form thin film optics with and... Uh, we also have, of course, uh, OLED materials, all these kinds. And we, I'm, I'm just curious if, if these materials could play a certain role in this new uh, market of uh, augmented reality and how that evolves. And I'm very, very interested in this discussion. For that, it's great to have an entry point uh, at your company. It is also great uh, to have a potential use of your materials in our optics. We prepared too many introductions, but I'm going to go back to Benjamin because I have a few interesting questions for you. The first one is coming all the way from Rochester, New York, one of our top companies in the world of freeform optics, Optimax. Jessica de Grotenelson, good afternoon for me, good morning for you. What's on your mind? Good morning. Uh, so one of the questions I have is excellent presentation. What are some of the limiting factors that you have for, for the weight of your, of your heads up display systems? So what, what is causing the most weight in your system right now? Um, well, uh, I would say we are not a uh, head up display um, manufacturer or developer. We are integrator. So um, I don't have the answer to this question, sorry. No, so um, it would be the, the whole thing at that point. <laughs> yeah. but, but let's revisit it then because we have a few manufacturers the, in the room. So I'm going to come back to you, Jessica, for this. The next question, we go from Rochester to Finland. Benjamin, this meeting is global. We go to Finland, we go to Tampere to talk to Jari Ovaskainen from the company Modulite, semiconductor laser manufacturer. What's on your mind? Yes. Hey, Benjamin, thank you for an excellent presentation and uh, uh, well, we have been uh, supplying for uh, with uh, our technology with uh, some uh, OEMs, and we are always puzzled a little bit that uh, it's uh, the value chain is uh, tiered. So they have these uh, tier one suppliers such as a uh, Bosch, Magna, Faurezia, Denso, and those companies, and uh, then OEMs and VAG Group, PSA. And uh, how how do you think that uh, which route is a uh, is a best, and how to introduce these uh, new innovations to the this uh, huge market? <clears throat> So can you repeat your question, sorry? Uh, yeah, uh, this uh, automotive... What is the easiest way for us, the Epic members, to bring our technology into your market? Exactly, exactly. So we I know am. that there's a, like tier one suppliers and then there is an OEM side. And uh, sometimes we think that uh, it's uh, tier ones where we should concentrate our efforts. And sometimes mm -hmm. we think that it's a uh, OEM side. Uh, I would say that for head of display, um, I think the, the easiest way to bring your technology to the market is to convince an OEM to do it. Um, okay. Yeah. So um, we we um, so there are I would say two um, possibilities to introduce an innovation 
uh, to a car manufacturer. The one is to, okay, to, brew, to build a POC mm -hmm. and to showcase to um, a car manufacturer or to convince this car manufacturer and then this car manufacturer will come to us and ask us to integrate it and, and, and make a product of it to uh -huh. integrate in a car. Renault and Estelantis are with us today. I'm going to come back to them later. I'm going to ask them. I'm going to push them to do that. <laughs> Benjamin, thank you very much for this. I have another question for you coming. We go from Finland to the Netherlands and we go from semiconductor laser manufacturer to one of the key companies that is pushing graphene in Europe. Startup Atrago, Santiago Jose Cartamil. Bueno, buenas tardes. Good afternoon, Joye Medag. What's on your mind? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Jose. Uh, yeah, thanks, Evan, I mean, for the presentation. Uh, I just had a straightforward question. I know that you do not make the display, so you integrate in case the display and the, the projector for, for the system, for the car. Um, do you use or do you intend to use uh, DLP, LCOS, uh, micro LED? Can you comment on that? Um, we, we, for us, we, we take the head of display at um as a device we 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 integrate we we do not uh we we do not get into the system but we can use this kind of uh yeah, um micro led or other system in in other project we have in the group yes i see so you don't have any preference uh, basically you you have some needs right uh, that you need to overcome the say the the uh, illumination from outside uh, so so and they has to withstand the temperature, um, you know, coming from the light, from the UV and the infrared, and that's it. That's kind of what you look for a display. Uh, yes, I would say, yeah. yeah. Okay, so maybe San we stay in touch. Next Santiago, time. no, 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 you mm -hmm. stay in touch right now because Santiago, you're a manufacturer of MEMS-based graphene displays and projectors. As soon uh, as, as cool as that sounds, uh, how, how the, do you see this market for the graphene technology? And could you tell us a bit of how you want to make a breakthrough, bringing graphene to somewhere it was never before? Okay, yes, I can comment quickly on this one. So uh, basically, as uh, Jose said, uh, we uh, uh, yeah, develop uh, this new technology, graphene mems uh, uh, display imaging technology and uh, we uh, intend to enter the micro display uh, sector with uh, with uh, this reflective type of uh, of technology um, yeah basically our uh, specifications are similar to DLP uh, so fast uh, and uh, and uh, very reflective but with uh, some additions uh, say um, lower power consumption higher withstanding higher optical powers so this is uh, where i think uh, we could uh, help and solve the problem of hud uh, projection in cars and aviation tracks and stuff like that santiago for you the world is your oyster i'm a huge graphene fan and i got really excited when we talked just before summer and things are going the right way so congratulations enhorabuena uh, benjamin i'm going to repeat for everyone your challenge everyone in the epic network we are looking for a material supplier that can provide the material with the high reliability for automotive that can actually filter out uv and infrared and can be the ideal material for head of displays to collaborate with modersons your Challenge is on the table, Benjamin. And we continue with the program and we go to the, semi the semiconductor giant in Europe. Our semiconductor giant is here in the room. Director of Business Development, Elan Roth from ST Microelectronics. We want to help with you. We want to help ST. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to you. We have Luca today. We have Luca uh, Segiji from ST. We will start with Luca. Because Ellen is, uh, well. Yes, Ellen was not available, so not available. I, I'm working okay. with Ellen. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, Luca, the floor is yours. Yes, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, wait, let me share the presentation. Share. Let me know if you see that. Crystal clear. Okay. So, yes. Uh, hi everyone, I am Luca Sigizzi, I'm a product manager inside ST Microelectronics uh, and uh, I'm dealing with uh, MEMS mirrors. Um, for those of you who are uh, unfamiliar with MEMS mirrors, uh, 
uh, what are they? Uh, they are uh, microactuators um, whose aim is to steer a beam of light in order to create a 2D image. And how do we do it in ST? Uh, we have this family of products that is called the MEMSCANR product, um, which consists in having uh, MEMS mirrors for laser beam scanning systems, meaning that you take uh, two mirrors, two 1D mirrors, uh, one horizontal mirror and one vertical mirrors, and uh, uh, you project a beam of light uh, in the, on the surface of them. And by the combination of the two, you can create a 2D image. Inside ST, uh, we don't have just the MEMS mirror, but inside this family of products, uh, we have also all the electronics that is uh, behind them, meaning uh, all the electronics to make them uh, move correctly, to make their right projection system correctly. So we have mirror drivers and laser drivers. And uh, with all these components and uh, all the know-how that we have uh, experienced uh, in the last years, uh, developing this technology, we managed to build our reference designs um, for augmented reality. So this is made on purpose for augmented reality. And uh, we did also something else. Uh, we founded the Laser Alliance ecosystem. This uh, Laser Alliance ecosystem uh, is uh, uh, an ecosystem uh, made by ST and other key founders um, to accelerate the time to market for augmented reality solution. Um, in this way, we want to bring the expertise of, this, of different companies uh, all together because this is a very uh, complicated technology and by the help of everyone in the Lazar Alliance, we can, uh, we can give a push to this market, we can uh, bring it to the market, uh, the augmented reality solutions very, very quickly and easier. And uh, here with me today, there is Yvonne from Mega One, one of our partners. So this was just a fast introduction, and now I let the stage for uh, Yvonne, uh, who can uh, who can go ahead with uh, with her slides, please. So Yvonne, now you can share your presentation. Perfect. You're muted. You're muted, Yvonne. We don't hear you. I think, Ivan, I think you're still muted. <laughs> Maybe, look, you can start presenting. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Sorry yes, for please. that. Okay. No worries. Sorry for that. Okay. Hi, this is Mega One Yvonne, and I'll present uh, the topic of technology introduction of laser RGB module. So, uh, I'm behave on Makoto, Mas Makoto Masuda san. Okay, here is the agenda that we have five agenda to uh, go through. Okay, so uh, Mega One is specialized the LBS module custom designed and the mass production manufacturer. We have factory for 5,000 uh, square meters and located in Taiwan. Uh, we, we service as a one stop. And also, of course, we were introduced by ST. So we are ST partner for over six years. And we got employee for 50 people and engineer for uh, 30 people. So we already devote uh, LBS technology for over 10 years. So Mega One is handling from uh, ST uh, wafer, from wafer level parts into the LBS module. So all made uh, processing uh, in Mega One office and the factory. And here are uh, uh, the LBS module design. So uh, we, we got talent and engineer team from uh, three cat uh, four categories, like a, a, like a relay race team to calibrate the module design. The optical team starts the first rod and mechanical team take the second one and electric team uh, is the third one. And last is the automation design team. So as well as the, uh, uh, module calibration process is a teamwork <laughs> from Mega One team that we already developed for many, many years. Okay. And here is the history of Mega One uh, LBS module. 
uh, since uh, 2016, uh, we got uh, uh, we got uh, cooperate with uh, ASU uh, from China for CAS1 uh, laser projector watch as well. This is the world first company to provide a very compact size laser optical engine that cooperate with ST Micro. 2016, 17, uh, we designed prototype of HUD light and temperature control system that can be received from zero degree to uh, something. This is a kind of prototype, uh, 85 degree with the thermal solution. Uh, 2018, we have the uh, a car type laser projector uh, in mass production and OBN to Acer uh, gateway brand and launch in key starter. Uh, 2019, uh, we got some AR uh, uh, this uh, a AR with a light guy, uh, light guy system, uh, which present with ST uh, seminar uh, in during CS. And 2020, we got the uh, LBA with HOE and also the laser twin type uh, module. Uh, and this year we got uh, LBS uh, with with which is three in one building with three in one laser and also the actual compatible with the actual design and also can be adjust from the relay lens for the special spot size. Okay. This is the uh, Mega One LBS uh, module design history. So Mega One, we focused on LBS optical engine design for uh, many years and gain experience on mass production expertise uh, through the ST micro mass mirror and of course the driver and also the control IC. So, and we also have the LBS know-how and obtain the uh, LBS portfolio patterns. And here is the LBS production flow. So you can see uh, the uh, top level from uh, COB processing, assembly system, processing and adjustment and calibration. So there are totally can be can be shown as uh, six steps. So uh, step one, uh, wafer level parts are die bonding to take out the mass from the wafer and glued on the LP, FPC correctly. And step two, uh, the white bond, the gold wire with uh, FPC to make sure you make it function on the FPC. Step three, uh, the assembly the laser and present uh, into a um, uh, module housing. Step four, the attach uh, assembly the uh, V and H mass mirror uh, FPC onto the module housing. Step five, uh, coordinate and adjust the optics such as uh, for mirror and coordinate the lens during the uh, optical system. Step, uh, last step is calibration, uh, laser characteristic and image performance of your software. Okay. So here is a more detail on each steps. Like a dye bond, we have designed some kind of, uh, we create some kind of soft pad to avoid overpressure. Meanwhile, let the dye position can be controlled. So this is try to speed up the assembly process. Uh, this is also uh, a automation design uh, in Mega One. And here, the, the another example is VH attach. Uh, we use the H mans reflection into the V mans to. Uh, to detect uh, and adjust the component position for the higher accuracy uh, of the uh, manufacturing process. Okay, so step five, collimation. Uh, so we just we try to adjust the full mirror with the collimator lens to eliminate the tolerance. So try to in improve the non-defecting ray during the manufacturing process. So, and last, the calibration, which uh, this is adopt the SD micro calibration tool uh, for uh, the image quality and also the, uh, also the laser characteristic. Okay, summary. Okay, Mega One Asper is the, the Asper of optical uh, design with the laser 
of ethical uh, engine know-how and LBS automation manufacturing uh, 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 design and uh, manufacture. Of course, the first basic is the OBS module design. So, uh, so with this, uh, we, gener we, we can provide the production capability for Mars market and to generate the compact size of optical engine that can perfectly fit on the near eye and also the HUD application. Okay. okay, here is the last page that I would like to share. Uh, this is a reference uh, information that we get uh, in August. Uh, the Infineon, they also uh, announced they have the laser man scanner for the eyeglasses and also the head up display. Uh, this is a really very good proven that uh, more real case that adopts uh, laser mats. And laser mats provide a better image quality performance and compact size and also the energy consumption, also the uh, last. Uh, competitive uh, system cost. So here is the end of my slides. And for more collaboration, please email to here and find Mega One for the laser uh, optical engine and mass production we can do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yvonne. And thank you, Luca. And now we have to, uh, we saw what you can do. It was a uh, a nice uh, presentation of the uh, Mega One catalog and also the uh, system that uh, ST is working on. And now I have to push you a little bit huh? because we have the epic question and that's the main reason um, you're here today is to tell us what kind of collaborations are you open for? Uh, I see from Jose email, from Jose messages that it's gonna be around the micro optics. So I wanna know, can you share some requirements or can you share some challenges to the, the, in the room uh, uh, for micro optics in terms of weight or durability and so on. You're, you're muted again. Look at you, feel free to <laughs> unmute as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you mean the micro optics? Okay, uh, my micro optics are uh, revolutionary. <laughs> Yvonne, let me help here because I cannot, I cannot stay quiet. My, my mother told me once, like, you really have to stay quiet, Jose, and I never listened to her. Let me, mm. let me you showed this slide, and I loved it. I really loved it. You were talking about uh, adjust the full mirror with collimator lens to eliminate the tolerance. And then when you were talking, all I could think about was the optics that we could use to improve that mm -hmm. process. So I'm mm -hmm. going to introduce you to a few companies that can mm -hmm. help you for the next mm -hmm. generation yes. because we want to help Mega One. So the first company I'm gonna introduce you is coming all the way from Neuchatel. The company is called SUS Micro Optics and is represented here by their CTO, Wilfred Null. Wilfred, good afternoon. Good afternoon, thank you. So I don't know you got half as excited as I did. I was very interested. <laughs> so so, so how, could you tell us a bit about the, the micro optics that we are developing now uh, by SUS in your case and by me for the whole Europe and how, how we could maybe get some challenges, help me get some challenges from Mega One. So, so we have three types of micro optics. So we work a lot in data and telecom, like, uh, like collimation optics, especially for, uh, for detectors and laser diodes and PICs for integrated optical circuits. So we do a lot of uh, micro optics there. So it's pretty similar to what you here have. Then we do a lot of illumination optics for laser systems in general. So all types of beam shaping. And the biggest and most growing market these days for us is automotive lighting. So where we do a lot of uh, 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 high volume micro optics for uh, decorative lighting and also for, for other external lighting systems in automotive. Uh, so we are very interested in, in how we can help you with, with, with our expertise. We have a large expertise. So in terms of uh, designing optics, finding the best solution for you in different materials in, in plastics or in, in glass or in silicon, depending on the wavelengths you use. So, and, and I would be very interested to know where you fit micro optics in your system, or maybe you can see uh, how okay. micro optics can help you in, in making it um, more cost efficient, smaller, 
Quilfred, and, Luca, and, I, Yvonne, not about cost, because of course we know that we are going to be always very cost efficient with micro optics, but the stray light, stray mm -hmm. light management mm -hmm. is the issue here, correct? Mm -hmm. Could you, could you uh, evolve in that challenge? Because I think there is when we have something quite, quite in your hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for the stray light, we have solution uh, of our uh, automation design. We already conquered, conquered the challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we already conquered. We use some uh, strategy and during the to set up uh, our automation system. Mm -hmm. Okay, could you could you then give me another challenge? <laughs> Let me come back to you. Let me come back to you on this mm -hmm. because I also want to address the topic of the mem scanning. You mm -hmm. mentioned Infineon as the example. I have actually a, a, another example since Infineon is not an Epic member, I'm going to say. I had the best example in the world, which is Occumented. Uh, Berthold Lange, are you with us all the way from Itzeho in Germany? Berthold? Berthold? Hi. Yes, I, could, I, I got nervous. I couldn't hear you for a second. Uh, we, we just saw uh, the different setups used by Mega One partnering with ST Microelectronics for MEM scanning systems. And I believe here there is quite a potential room for cooperation. I would like to see from the documented, from the MEM scanning on chip uh, success story from Itzeho, how do you see, see this market and what kind of room for cooperation can we enable here? Yeah. Um... First things first, uh, this is Jan Chutaski speaking. So I uh, took this slot from Berthold since he has to join another meeting. So I joined incognito. Um, but I'm working together with, with Berthold in the business development and also a little bit on other technical things. And uh, yeah, I, I followed with a lot of interest in this um, micro optics topic because yeah, we, we face same same issues. So. Uh, in making new products, but also in the testing and characterization of it. So, Yvonne, yeah, what I, is the I biggest think... challenge that we have for the MEM scanning? Uh -huh. uh, biggest challenge. Biggest you... challenge of yes. MEM scanning? Uh, I think the consistent, consistent manufacturing is the most uh, challenge from, uh, from the design to, to the to the uh, to the end part, you can ha you have to consistent all your products into very stable mm -hmm. performance. Yeah, yeah, because each laser have different characteristic. You know, consistent mem scanning. And when it comes to once you had the the mem scanner next to the laser, I assume that testing and validation is also a huge challenge. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Correct. Right. All right. So on this, I believe Occumented can really help because as he said, as he was saying by, by Bert called the substitute today, we do have uh, the potential to do this uh, at wafer level and with a process that is already proof scalable. I think there is some kind of room for cooperation, correct? Yes, yes. I would love to follow up the discussion, yeah. I would love that you switch on your camera, please, because I want to see you. Oh, yeah, but sorry, sorry, sorry. The, yeah, yeah. The, Thank you very much. Uh, with this, I think it is time now that we speak uh, back from the scanning. I want to go back to the optic side. Um, I want to talk now to one company that really made me really excited in the last in the last two years. Uh, we are talking about Neil Technologies all the way from Denmark. Uh, this company actually has been one of the biggest growth that we have seen in 2021 on the Epic Network. And also at the same time, they have actually been in the news everywhere because of their meta lenses. Uh, I do have some people from Neil Technologies with me in the room. So I would like to welcome Niklas Hanson. Niklas, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. I, I am so excited when, when I see you there and you're always like with the hair <laughs> perfect and the smile. I'm like getting even more excited. I want to understand here what kind yeah. of room for cooperation we can do with the companies in the room. But also, if you can tell us a bit about the Meta Lens story that we are hearing in the news, because that's something that we really want yeah, to see yeah. as a huge boom in Europe. I will, I will run through um, a few slides very quickly and then uh, hopefully I will leave a, a lot of time for, for questions and and discussions. Um, so first of all, we have three different categories of products. We have the diffractive optics, uh, where we're focusing a lot on dot projectors and flood illuminators, so diffusers. Then we have the meta optics, where we're making focusing lenses, uh, so the receiver side. And then we also have the track of future displays, 
where we make slanted and blazed gratings for uh, augmented reality um, heads up displays as well. Uh, so what we are excited about right now is that we are moving on from, from just prototyping to actually building uh, commercial cameras based on meta optics. We're starting out with 940 nanometer near infrared cameras and uh, <clears throat> we are tailoring these to, to different customers and building modules. Um, and it's the simplest possible camera you can think of because it's just one optic, one meta lens and the sensor. And this would be impossible to achieve with a single refract lens. So the, the resolution and the optical performance is, is quite astonishing. And this can be used for not only regular imaging, but also for time of, time of flight and structured light systems. So the image you see here to the right is taken with a single meta lens and a CMOS sensor. And then for the AR um, area, we are making masters and working stamps. We have been an established supplier of AR waveguide masters in 2000, 2015. Um, we're working with customer designs. You can see an example how, how it typically looks down here. You have an input grating, an expander grating, and an output grating. And these can be composed of either binary slanted gratings or blazed gratings. For the slanted gratings, we're proud to have very uh, parallel sidewalls, low roughness. And for the blazed gratings, uh, we also have a low roughness a straight blaze angle and a very sharp transition between the anti-blaze and the blaze. So that was three quick slides. And now I, I would love to have some discussions <laughs> with the audience here. So, you know, you went really fast. And <laughs> I, went, I went to, first of all, <laughs> what's really a meta lens? And what is the, from, from the user perspective, I know a technology from the user perspective, for, for my mother's song end user that we have in the room here, for the person from Renault, what yes. is a meta lens and how can it help in this business? So, so a meta lens is a flat piece of optic. Um, think of it as a, as, as a piece of glass, flat, with a very, very thin, uh, structure on it. It's just a few hundred nanometers uh, thickness of the, of the functional structure in the lens. And there are many different exciting aspects of these meta lenses, which makes it different from the refractive. For example, in the automotive industry, uh, it's important to have something which is insensitive to temperature change. And that is one property of the meta lens. So, uh, the focus shift is very low uh, when you have changes in temperature compared to refractive comparison. It is also possible to have a very high relative illumination. So usually when you have refractive optics, the, um, uh, it gets darker when you go to the corners of the image. That is something which is completely different with the meta lenses. So there are a number of these uh, different optical aspect, which is completely different from the refractive lenses. So this year, earlier this year, I asked them to come. They could not participate, but they know they're watching. So I asked them to participate. But earlier this year, just before summer, we saw the huge push for Samsung on the flat meta lenses for the automotive cameras and automotive sensors. And that really evolved into getting a lot of questions in Epic from this kind of technology. Uh, when it comes to uh, the, the, su the su sustainability to go into volume production, uh, how, could you comment on that, on that particular aspect? Yes. We're going to take this to these huge companies that are really demanding this now. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we've been working um, for several years with the with the mass production process, and it's based on on nano imprint. Um, and the beautiful thing about using nano imprint is that we can start out with a very high accuracy master defined with e beam lithography, and then we can um, replicate it with nano imprint in order to preserve that high precision. And we have also been able to show optically that we have the same functionality in the uh, replicated uh, optics as we have when we only make prototypes based on the e-beam and etching. I want to go back to Benjamin here. 
Benjamin, we are talking about uh, the, the meta lenses. We are talking about how this technology can actually be bringing very thin optics to automotive and to high volume production at the same time, because it's high reliability and at the same time, replication. They cannot use a word, but I can. Affordable replication to, to actually satisfy the needs for cost and efficiency. Could you, could you uh, comment from the end user system integrator perspective in automotive, if you have been looking at this and if these thin optics have a problem to solve in your challenges? Yeah, yeah for sure, for sure. Um... I can tell you, for example, that um, uh, infrared system going to be mo used more and more in the automotive industry to monitor many different things, like to monitor the driver, to monitor the um, exterior of the, the car. And um, the integration is a very important parameter. So if the system can be slim and also not sensitive to the temperature, this is, um, this is of high interest for sure for the automotive industry. Uh, one thing I would like to go back now to, I would like to go back now to Neil Technologies because uh, Wilfred Null from Sus Microoptics has a question, I would say the question for you. Wilfred, maybe you should ask yourself. Uh, first of all, um, thank you very much, uh, Jose, giving me the opportunity again. So um, first of all, I'm very impressive impressed by the results that you're showing. So of course, we're following NIL technology very closely. And, and uh, since you're also in Switzerland, we, we, we know what your development is, is quite impressive. So and uh, but I just wondered the, the lenses that you showed or that become commercially available soon for, for certain companies, what is the overall optical efficiency? What, what or what is efficiency is expected or and what could you deliver there? This is uh, very impressive again. Thank you, Wilfred. It's a, yeah. it's a great question. Um, mm. So <clears throat> I'm actually not allowed to disclose exactly <laughs> what efficiency we have, but we I can say I can say that um, uh, it is going to be very competitive. Um, and if if you have a project where where you think it's relevant, then I can disclose it under NDA. Okay, thank you. Very I much. love when they say that's a great question, but mm. I cannot answer it. That is, I, I love when this happens at the meetings. Uh, I would like to, to also ask, uh, ask Benjamin, uh, when it comes to the application of coatings of other materials on the top of the metal lenses, do we have uh, certain challenges there in terms of addition, in terms of bubbles that may appear next to, next to these very small structures? Um. For us, no, Benjamin, said, sorry, I, I meant for, oh, sorry, Neil Technologies. Okay, okay. Oh, sorry. Niklas, Niklas. Sorry, yes, when it comes to adding new materials, coatings, yeah. do you have any challenges when we, to, to add uh, different coatings, maybe perhaps bubbles can appear small uh, next to the structures, addition? No, so right, right now we have this platform, which is uh, silicon on glass uh, in, the, in the near infrared. <clears throat> so one challenge is, of course, that if you want to go to visible, um, lens, a lens directed for the visible spectrum, then you have to change the material platform. So it's a different uh, platform, but we, we don't have any real issues in, in the, um, now in the near infrared, which is coming first. We do have the visible um, area on the roadmap as well, but that's coming later. Point later. Can you tell us? Uh, so I, I think, maybe two years, we, we have an MP process ready for the visible as well. Uh, but right now, we, it's uh, the mass production of the uh, near infrared is around the corner. There are many people who want to help you with the functional films. Actually, we do have a company in, in Epic, you know the company Kimoto? Christoph, Christoph, good afternoon. Are you with us? Good afternoon, yes. We are talking about uh, the different challenges that we had when, when we have this flat optics with different structure to apply different materials uh, to them sometimes could be a challenge. Uh, I know that when it comes to thin film, you are one for key stars in your network. Could you, could you comment on that? What is the experience? What is the track record? What kind of things you can do for bringing your, your active coatings into these flat optics? So our company specialized in making coatings on, on a kind of plastic substrates. So that's really our core competence. So we work with like wet coatings, 
So usually in such process, we would do maybe a base material that is then used to structure later. So we have heard from uh, Motherson, for example, UV filters, IR filters, the combinations thereof. So these are things we can add to a, to a base film that is then later processed, maybe uh, structured. So we are really specialized in homogeneous coatings, uh, chemical coatings while I hear from SUS micro optics or NILT that they, they probably work on structuring, adding additional things on top of it. So what we usually do, we work with such companies to make or prepare the base film with certain uh, properties that they then later can use as a base for their processes. I want for the companies who make the flat optics, I want them to consider the challenges on this. And I know it's very hard to share, so it has to be shared with NDA, but we can make the right introductions. I think right now when it comes to the supply chain, because I'm thinking about Benjamin all the time, Modelson Group, I'm thinking about him and I'm thinking, okay, I'm having all these technologies to make the next generation optics. I see the free form uh, optics of, of Optimax. Then I see the, the meta lenses from NILT. Is there a way to combine it, to compare them? I think. Let me go first to Oliver finally, because you may have an idea, a challenge on this, and then I will go to Mother Stones to see how they can design their supply chain. Maybe Oliver from Pandao Technologies, you can help Mother Stone design their supply chain, actually. Okay, hey, thank you. I just uh, asked the question in the chat. Well, if I remember back decades ago, they said no more A-spheres needed because now we apply holograms on top of spherical surfaces and we are fine. And now I see meta faces, meta surfaces competing with free forms. So everybody is building up his own castle, competing with each other. Why are we not building something like a holographic meta surficial free form optical element that does everything? Because we need the integrator to, 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 to demand that. We need Modern Group to demand that. Because mm -hmm. if that is a demand, we'll make it happen. Yeah, because yeah. because you can do you can do optics replication design, you can do a micro optics a fabulous uh, design, and you can and there are people like Jessica who know who have the black belt not in karate but in fabrication of free forms. So why not combining all this instead of competing? I'm a small company. I can ask such questions. Oh, but yeah. uh, I I also don't mind. Don't afraid of asking. I I, I think. Let's go first to Jessica and to Sebastian. We have Jessica from Optimax and Sebastian from Aspherikon, the manufacturer of freeform optics. Uh, Jessica from Optimax, is there a, a, perhaps a challenge of an opportunity that you would observe by having these meta surfaces on the top of the aspherical or freeforms? Well, I think it's a, it's a very interesting topic and I definitely, I think worth exploring a little bit. I think that the, the added degrees of freedom you can get with your optical design for adding free forms and then to couple that with being able to potentially even further reduce the size of your system by integrating the, the, the uh, meta surface or um, some type of structured surface on your freeform surface could be very interesting. However, as you mentioned, it's going to take a, it's going to take a, a village in order to be able to do that because it's going to take designers and then the fabrication technologies used to make the the macro freeform lenses is different than uh, what Neil just described in terms of the, um, the the microlithography for for doing the the meta surfaces. So, but being able to figure out a way to to collaborate and work forward, as as Oliver mentioned, and uh, would be I think a very interesting. Uh, a very interesting project. Oh, if there is a reason there will be a way, but uh, for me, it's the, the, the challenge. I would like to, to ask Sebastian, Sebastian from Aspericon. Sebastian Henkel, yeah. are you with us? I'm here, yes. So you, you know you know what you saw what Jessica said. If they, uh, we are really looking forward to collaborate. I would like to ask you the same thing. You just heard from NILT. They can make these fantastic yeah. meta surfaces. And you can yeah. hear, you just heard from Pandao. They are thinking, hey, why don't we just make the best optics ever combining free force and meta surfaces. What's yeah. in your mind? Yeah, so uh, pretty much goes along with uh, which what Jessica said, and uh, I like the uh, the command from Pandao. So why don't uh, think about a collaboration on that? Uh, and if it comes to miniaturization of, of uh, systems and things like that, I think there, there must be a way on apply such surfaces on free forms. So yeah. Definitely looking forward to that uh, and taking it back to the technology team here within Aspherikon and discuss it further. Sebastian, you have a slide. I was told you have a slide to share with the public. I, I have one slide, yeah, yes. just a quick one, yeah. 
Tell, tell me, tell me, because you know I'm a huge fan of the what you do in Jena. Okay, so let me share it. You can see my screen, right? Crystal clear. Go slideshow mode so we can see okay, it bigger. Perfect. perfect. Yeah, just um, uh, a quick introduction uh, for those of you who don't know Aspherecon yet. Uh, it's basically um, uh, a map of uh, what the capabilities here at Aspherecon are. Uh, we obviously just talked about free forms, uh, but also spheres. And obviously, the next step can be how to apply uh, uh, yeah, surfaces or structures onto that. Uh, along with that, uh, not only the components, uh, also comes the system and the system um, um, or subsystems for, for integrators. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, uh, we also provide uh, the services if, if it comes to uh, the optical design. Uh, we just talked about system miniaturization and uh, production optimization, actually, uh, through a real data model or real, uh, real data modeling, which is supported by our a database which uh, <clears throat> basically consists of several thousand lenses ever manufactured and this can also be a good starting point for um, yeah any kind of new developments uh, if it comes to components systems uh, systems which have to resist uh, very harsh environments um, which is obviously key uh, in the head-up display business temperature differences humidity uh, contamination of anything things like that and the coatings, of course. So we provide uh, sputter uh, surfaces up to 5.1 microns uh, on, uh, yeah, for any kind of uh, optical surfaces. And uh, this has been uh, deployed to many manufacturers and um, system integrators in the automotive industry as well into the uh, aerospace industry. So basically anything which drives and flies, uh, and that pretty much concludes it. Uh, just to give you a, a quick overview of what a sphere can, can do for the business. So um, yeah, open to your questions. And uh, of course, we are always on the lookout for system integrators and system suppliers uh, to the automotive and aerospace industry. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Thank you very much, Jessica, as well from Optimax. I want to say here the message is that if we don't have the challenge from the integrator, we can say that we are willing to collaborate, but that means nothing. So here is from the person in, from Renault in the room. We are actually asking you to, to give us some hints here. And thank you very much, Modersons, for that. But uh, Johan, Johan Research is represented today in the room, and we would like to give the floor to them because uh, Paul Harman has something on his mind all the way from Graz in Austria. Yes, so uh, hello, Jose, and thanks for uh, introducing me quickly. So I'd just, just like to comment on the question that we had in the last discussion uh, before the last uh, presentation. So I, I do not think that there is such a big competition between metal lenses, freeforms, and holograms, uh, because uh, in a way, all of them are in uh, kind of freeforms. Yeah, so they are. Uh, and it, uh, we have to take a closer look maybe on uh, the uh, value chain of what has to be done to produce these components. And uh, then it starts uh, with uh, optical simulation, uh, which is of course the major difference when it comes to these three different types of lenses. Uh, and then we have a lot of similarities because you need a mastering, you need an imprint process, um, you need uh, a, a measurement process uh, at the end for quality control. And uh, it, it's not so much difference, I think, uh, in, in, in principle on these three components, if it's now a hologram by design, if it's a freeform lens by design, or if a meta, it's a metal lens by design. And therefore, there's, uh, there's not really a competition in most of the value chain, but there can be found a lot of synergies. At the end of the day, what we want to do with the meta lens is to reach the high volume. So on that, I think is where you really come to the table. What you have done in the role to role and role to play manufacturing is an example to follow. So on this, he didn't say because Paul is very nice, so I'm going to say it. If you're looking for the right R&D partner to bring your meta materials R&D and your meta lens R&D to volume production, you have to contact Paul Hartman. We have two questions in the room. The first one is coming all the way from Bogdo. It's coming from the company Polarize. Provider of thin film technology, David Bereiser. What's on your mind? David? 
Yes, you are muted. I want to see you. I want to hear you. Um, yeah, very interesting to, to hear uh, everything about uh, those uh, challenges and uh, these micro optics. We are at Polyrise, we are doing wet coating and especially anti reflective coating. Uh, so we have developed a, a specific chemistry that allows us uh, to coat any kind of substrate and complex uh, shape. Um, most uh, mainly uh, uh, anti-reflective coating for visible spectrum or um, infrared spectrum. So any of you who have a challenge in uh, managing stray lights uh, with your optics, just come to us. When it comes to managing the stray light, at the end of the day, the problem with the stray light is that it's affecting the brightness of the image. And there, the problem with the coating has to be to be able to don't affect the brightness. Do you, did you come up with that challenge? Did you come up with that challenge before from end user? Did you manage a way to address it? Because you, you remember the challenge of Motherson. They are looking to filter the infrared and to filter UV. Yeah, so far we reduced to reduce uh, the the reflection. Uh, now we are not able to to manage uh, some filterings while improving the reflection on a server, uh, certain uh, portion of the wavelengths, uh, because our process is based on a mono layer, uh, and uh, our market today are really for mass production where uh, um, um, a huge volume of lenses has to be uh, coated, uh, but. We are only on one layer, uh, which provide functionality and not a, a stack of several layers. Before we go, thank you so much. Merci beaucoup, David. Um, before we go to the next speaker, I would like to remind everyone that in EPIC, we do have the EPIC member Pandao, who actually has developed a software in which you can compare all the different manufacturing processes to come up with the optics that you need to put into volume production and come up with the right supply chain with companies that can provide it and even finding out what should be the cost per lens given the volume. That's a fantastic software that is in the EPIC network thanks to the company Pandao. You want to hear more about this please contact epic and i want to know i want to go now to back to head of this place because we have in in the in the network we have in our meeting today one of the success stories in europe on this particular sector we have mv6 and ralph mende director of the supply chain remember director of the supply chain of mv6 is here with us with challenges this is a presentation you've all been waiting for i want to generate leads i want to generate leads ralph help me share the challenges the world and the attention of everyone goes to mv6 hello ralph mende wow fantastic background beautiful background i i know the city <laughs> um can you see my screen? It is coming. It is here. OK. Um, thank you very much, Jose, for introducing me and for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak for, for this incredible audience. Very honored, very humbled to do so. Uh, in physics, um, uh, our, at in physics, our mission is uh, delivering a new driver experience uh, through dynamic holographic head-up displays. Um, who is Envisix? So Envisix was founded three years ago in England, UK, and uh, the technology was developed already more than 20 years ago uh, at Cambridge University. Um, in physics itself, our business model is set of a tier two. Uh, so we are the technology owner for this um, holographic uh, displays. Uh, and we supply uh, so-called PGU to tier ones and OEMs. And uh, our suppliers, mostly component suppliers, EMS companies, um, so as a service providers. Uh, and Visix itself, as I said, is still a young company. Um, last year, we finished a round, a, a round B uh, funding um, and uh, acquired more than $50 million uh, 
on this be serious funding um, and getting uh, new stakeholders like um, Hyundai, um, like um, uh, GM um, and Syke from China. Um, the technology uh, of holographic uh, displays, dynamic holographic displays has several uh, advantages. Uh, it provides a very uh, small package size uh, and you can achieve uh, very good system uh, parameters like contrast, resolution, dynamic range, uh, color depth, and optical efficiency. Um, there is a um, presentation here on the, on the bottom illustrating a comparison between a holographic head-up display and a more pixel-type display like in a TFT, a TLP, uh, or maybe in a scanning um, system, uh, where you usually, each pixel gets to a pixel on the screen, which is different in holographic displays. Uh, in holographic displays, the entire information, the entire uh, image, the entire brightness gets to the uh, gets to every point on the on the image. So that provides an outstanding optical efficiency, but also a very high robustness for pixel failures because a single pixel failure is not anymore corresponding to a pixel failure in the image. Um, we have delivered uh, generation one uh, uh, based on this technology uh, with a tier one from Japan uh, a couple of years ago. More than 250,000 display uh, cars were equipped with uh, such a display. Um, now uh, we are working on our second generation, and the advantage of second generation head-up display is fully augmented. It's a very wide uh, field of view and it has multi-plane image information. So not only the center stack uh, information here, but also other information for localization, for navigation, um, some examples visible here. Um, this outgoing too much into detail, let me jump directly into uh, what we are looking for. And I know this is a fantastic and a great community to collaborate. So I'm really looking forward to network with you, to collaborate with you on our new developments, new generation of head up displays. Uh, I think areas to cooperate are key components uh, like laser diets, diffractive optical elements, light guides, polarization retarder solutions, uh, even motors, uh, which are to some extent used, optical components in the widest sense. Um, also looking for design services, optical design services, uh, End of line tester calibration automation solutions. We are very interested. Um, always for prototyping express manufacturing services. And of course, last but not least, in smart people to uh, join us, to work with us in um, and making this a, a big thing going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that presentation. This is what I call everyone, this is what I call a gold slide. So they can hear, not to show off what they do, by the way, if you want to be amazed, check the YouTube channel because it's quite fascinating, but also to find the right partners for this. And I would like to, first of all, to open the room for anyone who can collaborate and help the company with their technology. But also I would like to ask uh, Ralph, when it comes to the laser diodes itself, I don't think we have discussed enough in this meeting about the challenges of laser diodes. Can you uh, give us a bit more meat there? Wavelength, power, aspect ratio, power consumption. What else can you tell us about your demands for laser diodes? 
Yeah, we usually use, uh, so of course it's a RGB display. Uh, so we, we need uh, all three colors basically. Um, the technology works, needs a, a single mode uh, laser diet solution. Um, but thanks to the high efficiency of the system, uh, power requirements are not so high. So we can usually work with much lower power than uh, other projection displays do. Um, and um, I think there are some solutions we adopt today, but I think there is still a lot of potential going forward, um, uh, improving those components like laser diets. And um, yeah, uh, this can be, uh, of course, need to be automotive grade because this is an automotive uh, type product. But uh, yeah, so we are looking for solutions in, for those components. Uh, I also like that you did mention uh, that you that there is a challenge for the light guides. I believe that we have somebody from this Pelix in the room all the way from Finland. Pia Hart, are you with us, Pia? Yes, here I am. Yes, please switch on your camera. Hi. Oh, why do I always have to ask you? <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Coming all the way from Finland, or member, or epic member 500. Look how much you grow since then. Uh, yeah. I would like to ask you when you saw the challenges from MV6 and um, where they, they, they put the light guides, the, the, the weight guide technology as a challenge. I want, to, I want to come to you. How do you see this market and what kind of room for cooperation have you seen with a company like MV6? Definitely. So I, I know Ralph already for, for quite a while and definitely will, I think we'll be in touch. Uh, definitely what, um, the light guides uh, will play an impor important role in, in these. Um, developments and and there are a lot lots of these developments I think in the market um, currently this Felix uh, business is on the um, augmented reality glasses glasses so that's where the focus is in currently but then again the technology is very similar for for us. Uh, when it comes to uh, ramping up to production, so ramping up the, the in production for the size, of course, the, 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 the optics, the, the lenses that are required by MV6 are larger than the one that you are used to with your success story, which I don't think I comment that much, but we all know it already. So uh, how, how do you see this? How do you see a technology going into bigger aspect ratio to feed the head-up display market? No, there is, uh, there's definitely um, options to also um, enlarge the weight guide size. Um, I think then it's really up to the system level what, what sizes are needed there within the within the individual systems. But I, 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 uh, Jose, I also need to mention that when I, I just a lot of people probably know you know me from uh, CDA, ten years with CDA, and my first selection of getting a new job was to check if they are. Epic members, <laughs> and you and you got to one of the amazing ones, and yes. uh, it was congratulations on the career move, and also mm -hmm. congratulations on leading the world of wake technology for augmented reality at this Felix. Quite an impressive career track record that you are building. Thank you, Pia. Thank I would you. like to go back to to Ralph. Uh, I'm getting a lot of questions in the chat uh, asking me if what you need are pixels, um, pixel arrays. Uh, are you evaluating different pixels? array solutions at this moment for your laser diode needs? Are you evaluating different array solutions in the RGB wavelength range? Um, yeah, so uh, the uh, holographic um, modulator, uh, it, it's a core piece of our technology. Um, it's, uh, we, we develop and build this ourselves, but I think there are uh, a lot of things we are looking for, uh, like um, liquid crystal material for Merck or other, other vendors uh, that could make a great contribution to our product. And yeah, we work on different aspect ratios, different sizes going forward. Um, all we know is displays uh, supposed to become bigger and bigger in the car and entertaining us in future. So. Uh, I think this is a great technology uh, supporting this trend. I'm going to go now to ask you about the polarizer. 
because uh, I was very happy to say that you're looking for a polarization retarder technologies here. I, I always thought that polarizing uh, in the high-end market was not a challenge anymore because you can buy polar you can buy polarizing glasses for nine euros in the in any shop this summer. So, uh, what is the challenge that you see in the in the polarizing technology in the polarizers for the for the optics? Is it price? Is it, is it volume reliability? Oh, uh, so basically, there are all over challenges, right? Uh, there are all over solutions, uh, best and second best. And um, actually, yeah, uh, I think it's about uniformity. It's about the contrast. Um, it's about cost, of course, uh, but also about durability. Uh, how, um, these are key, key parameters. The, the, the cost is going to be a challenge. I think that the uniformity when it comes to your surfaces could be the big challenge. Could you give us some ideas there? What is the size? What is the, the standard size that you're looking here uh, for, the, for the whole optics? Um, uh, you, put, you put the hands, the, the, the size of the optics that you need to quote, would you need to, to quote with a polarizing filter? Um, like okay, this, so, so the, the, the size of the polarizing filters, so it's yeah. just a small, small piece of uh, uh, component. So it's just maybe just call a number a centimeter in square. So it's not a huge thing, maybe two centimeters in square. Uh, it's not a huge thing, right? It's about the magnification in the system. But uh, so in the design, those components usually at an area where this, the component size is not so big, so to keep the cost down. So my present for you is the following. There is, uh, in Europe, there is a pilot line for manufacturing uh, micro optics and for manufacturing micro optic processes for companies like you, customized to help companies like you. And representing the pilot line fabulous, we have the sales director uh, and personal friend of mine, Jessica Van Heck, Huyemeda Jessica. Uh, fabulous is the tool to help. And V6. I cannot think about if Fabulous cannot help in V6, we should close Fabulous today. What do you think? Uh, of course, I mean, anyone interested in FIFA micro optics uh, can come to Fabulous because this is our aim. We want to be the one stop shop. So, I mean, you've heard already today from uh, many of our members, Joanneum, uh, Seuss, Morphotonics are uh, all here. So uh, we, uh, we can help everyone who wants to get into Murphy for micro optics and help them set up the right partner. We really uh, aim to uh, uh, represent the entire supply chain from design services to prototyping to large scale manufacturing. So uh, yes, of course, anyone is welcome to contact me. So in that we can, we can help because this is a, we can offer a, a test big before seriously invest, Ralph, and you can get access to the technologies of SUS Microoptics for the nano imprint low cost reproduction. You can get the role to play technologies of morphotonics, the role to role technologies represented by, by Joanne and Research in the room. All this access to you, the like European Microoptics Revolution offered to you thanks to our partners, the European Commission, and thanks to the amazing Jessica Van Heck. I would like now, with all this discussion that we have, to introduce our last speaker and then to set up a debate of the kind of things that we can now work together. But we cannot set up that debate without having the success story of glass manufacturing worldwide in the room. Coming all the way from, I love saying that, Europe is shot. Matthias Jots, head of production, head of production at SHOT, connecting the right level with the right level. I would like Matthias to find ways of working with more epic members of the floor and the attention of everyone goes to SHOT goes to the glass success. Hello, this is Matthias speaking. Can you hear me and no. also see my screen? Loud and clear and Gorilla Glass clear. <laughs> Very good. So my name is Matthias Jotz. I'm doing a product management for augmented reality at SHOT. And let me walk you through in the next few minutes of what SHOT is doing and what specifically we can contribute to that industry. So um, we have uh, 135 years of heritage in glass uh, development and fabrication. So um, our founder is Otto Schott, 
who has actually invented optical glass and also borosilicate glass. So a, a lot of stuff that you uh, are wearing or are uh, having in, in your pockets or even cooking with are uh, made of innovations uh, done with or, or by shot. And that is somehow part of our DNA, which brings me also to the very important point uh, that we would like to, of course, continue that kind of heritage that we have now also in AR and also head up this place. So we are also mainly focused on uh, the glasses type augmented reality. Um, there we see uh, big potentials everywhere, but we do not limit ourselves to this. We also say we can contribute to head up this place uh, being on a waveguide basis. So um, what we believe at SHOT is, is that uh, waveguides are the key enabling technology uh, that unlock basically a lot of augmented reality experience. And um, as a material manufacturer, um, maybe some of uh, the people in the group here will um, also um, share that opinion. It is not so easy to find out what properties our material and our substrates need to have in order to serve the market best. So um, basically it's always as a material supplier, you can do a lot of things things, but um, the challenge to do what's really right is, is, is one of the main challenges. And that's also part of my job as a product manager here at SHOT. So, and this is why I want to share with you um, our view on what is uh, very important on a, on a waveguide substrate, um, because this directly image um, impacts image quality. So um, basically four of the main characteristics are High transmission, because this, of course, uh, very well um, um, influences the system efficiency. A low thickness tolerance, because that influences image quality. A tailored refractive index, because uh, basically all the technology is coming beyond the waveguide um, are uh, somewhat connected to the refractive index and then of course also to the um, uh, angle of, of uh, total refraction in there. And, and that is um, in our opinion, especially for head up displays very important is the format. Since uh, for some point wafer formats might not be enough to um, do everything that we need on a um, head up uh, augmented reality based head up display. And uh, that is also for us as a material manufacturer uh, to consider. So our answer for this is, is that uh, on the basis of our review technology, which is in the augmented reality world quite well known, uh, we have a comprehensive portfolio of melting technologies and materials to supply not only wafers, but also on the uh, sheet uh, basis, which we can uh, supply basically different um, materials made by uh, different large scale manufacturing technologies. Um, to put this uh, a little bit uh, more in, in practice, there's basically two different kinds of, of what we do, right? So on the one hand, there is uh, optical glass that, that we can offer with a very high internal uh, quality, very high homogeneity, very high uh, refractive index uh, homogeneity. And then also on the uh, technical glass side, um, we can supply high sub, um, transmission materials on, on a really large uh, formats. And uh, here is um, already, let's say, um, the last slide of my presentation. And, and that would be rather um, my question to you. So uh, challenge us and please uh, let's develop together something which directly fits in, into your uh, application's needs. Thank you so much, Matthias. Thank you so much, Matthias. Thank uh, you. So you you showed us what uh, what you want the people to challenge you with, but is there any challenges you would like to share with our audience today? Um, specific uh, specifications for what you're producing. 
Yes, yes, of course. And, and that is basically the slide um, I, I have shown uh, um, here. Yeah, when, when we are talking about um, high transmission, yeah, my, 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 my challenge and, and my question would be, um, yeah, where exactly do we really need to be in order to do um, to, to, to find the sweet spot between um, production cost and, uh, and, and, and basically quality that we need in the end for the ecosystem. That is uh, basically my, um, my main uh, question and challenge uh, according to this uh, substrate properties here. I, I I am a speechless, Matthias. I really am a speechless. I, I really want so and this is very difficult to 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 manage when you actually manage that. So for me, the, the thing <laughs> here that thank you that we need to address, and I have been talking to to many of your colleagues uh, in the past, is about uh, this refractive index tuning for increasing the field of view. Mm. And there there are many different challenges. One of them is in the coating. The other one is in the different multi-layers that we can assume. In the other one is actually having different materials along the entire optic. I would like to, to go a bit deeper into this. What is your, if you can share and share what you can share, of course, but what is your vision? How can we actually tailor the refractive index to increase the field of view to this below 150? So, um... My vision, of course, is, is to go uh, well beyond uh, 2.0 and then also scale this up on a format which would also be um, capable of, of handling a head-up display application. Um, but there are uh, multiple challenges, especially as a glass manufacturer when it comes to the material. And on the material side, there we have the refractive index thing. And on, on the other side, but then the production side, because once you go high with a refractive index, uh, you are limited in the production ways of, of how you can melt the glass. And, and once, um, it, basically there's a trade-off, right? So, so either you want a very, very high format basically, or a big format, which would be then also, let's say in, in compliance with automotive industry and a relatively lower um, refractive index, or you go very high with refractive index, but then you would be somehow limited in format, right? So the vision would be, of course, to combine both. Yeah. My vision means nothing because unfortunately I don't make optics like you guys do, but my vision is uh, to find some way that you can actually print the coatings, so you can actually like tune the refractive index depending on the position in the optics. There is a company in the room coming all the way from Finland it's the company Incron. Yuka, Yuka Parentino, are you with us? Yuka Parento? Yuka? Yes, I'm, yes, I'm, I'm here. Yeah. So this is my vision. Can you, can you help? If we could actually find a technology that could print the coating into the optic for this large optics with the large field of view. Yes, I, I, I think that it's to, to, totally possible. Um, so so far, these uh, head-up displays they have, they have been mostly manufactured uh, with the holographic approach. But I think that the uh, like our our main target that we work with is diffractive optics. And as uh, B already mentioned, I I don't see any reason why one couldn't make a uh, diffractive optics based head-up display using the similar technologies what are being used now with the uh, AR glasses. Just, just a little bit bigger, bigger substrate, and that's it. But look at what, uh, what we are hearing from shot. When you look at the substrate properties, the Taylor refractive index is a challenge for them, which uh, in, in other, for them, sorry, it's a challenge for the industry. So for yes. others, it's not. Why, why, why do you think is that? And um, maybe Matthias can comment later, but why do you think that is, if you think that this could be easily solved with, with printing the coating? Well, I, I, I don't know e easily, but the, we have actually worked with the shot quite quite a bit, so so we don't know each other. But uh, like we we have the same target with shot going over 2.0 or at least 2.0, and actually we hope hope to be ready with that work within this uh, 
for fall time to come out, out with our 2.0 material. We are already quite a bit over 1.9 anyway. So that, that should help quite a bit with this uh, field of view uh, problem there when, when we come out, out with that. And uh, we, we have an optimized solution for soft, uh, brand new uh, low weight material, which they just recently promoted. So we have matched our coating refractive index exactly with, uh, with uh, that substrate. So that, that optimization work should help with, with these targets. I know that many people in the room have uh, some questions here, but before I go to them, I'm going to go back to Matthias. Matthias, um, you also talk about the low thickness tolerance for your substrate. Yes. Um, I, I don't know to what extent you can share some numbers to, with us, but that's a challenge that I would like to put in the open. Is there anything else that you can give us on what is the, why, why the low thickness tolerance is a, is a challenge and what kind of challenge it is? Okay, so in, in general, on, on a functional level, of course, um, the less parallel your, um, your surfaces on a, on a total reflective waveguides are, of course, uh, the, the more you deteriorate your, your uh, MTF in the end, right? So, so that's the reason why we need it. We need very parallel uh, surfaces. And um, that deterioration of the, of the MTF, of course, we need to keep uh, very small. And now, um, why this is a challenge? Because um, if at least um, if for the for the time we are also um, working a lot with Incron and, and with also a lot of other companies here, is 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 for us especially um, in order to make that very flat, we have very low tolerances, and that tolerances are well below one micrometer on an on an eight inch wafer or, or even on a twelve inch wafer. If if we are now uh, looking into that and and that is a manufacturing challenge. And then if you are looking into consumer electronics ramp up scenarios, of course, uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's challenging, right? And, uh, but um, yeah, of course we take on the challenge. In the beginning of the meeting, Matthias, we talk about meta lenses. I talk about meta lenses a lot because I love them. I, I know, well, I don't know, but I assume that in exploratory mode, this has been considered, evaluated, studied. Uh, what is your take on this meta lenses revolution that seems to be starting to happen? Um, so what, what we are seeing there is, uh, and here I can also uh, only, only repeat what, what um, I think it was Niklas, right, from NILT said, and um, he, he said uh, basically now it's starting with... Uh, with uh, infrared based uh, systems. And I think that's uh, not only because the technology is um, there to do that right now, but also because the market demands it, right? That's a very sweet spot to get in there, right? But uh, also here we need substrates. And, and of course, um, this is also a field where we are very active and also very keen on talking to um, all the people in the in the supply chain and value chain and, and welcome uh, to develop new solutions there. Niklas, you've been mentioned and um, when it comes to, to low thickness in general, I always I always think about you. You you told me to do that. So so Niklas, how how do you respond to Matthias? Did you start from infrared because it was a, a market uh, low hanging fruit, or because it was uh, evolution of your technology, or basically because you had to start somewhere? Yeah. So uh, there is quite a few really exciting high volume applications in the near infrared, and it's the the sensors for time of flight and structured light when you map out the room you get these 3D images of the room. And that is a very interesting application for the meta lenses. Um, so that is why we are um, starting in, in that, with that wavelength range. But <clears throat> it is expanding. We're also working with swirls of the longer wavelengths. And uh, I mean, we're already now getting requests for the visible range. So that is also something we need to to mature. 
And I think here there is a clear partnership. I would like to come to the room. We have a lot of companies in Epic that are providing the materials. And uh, one thing, Matthias, that I keep uh, asking is when it comes to, to black coatings, when it comes to material that, that can absorb uh, the light that, uh, that touches the glass, is there an application? Is there a, a demand? Is there a, perhaps a challenge that you can cover with those? Matthias. Yes, let me think, you see. So um, basically, when we get asked to do, um, let's say, dark coatings, black coatings, uh, at least to our understanding, it's often about stray light. Um, so since we are, let's say, the guys who are developing uh, coatings on a real a specialty level, um, maybe... Um, I am maybe not the perfect um, but guy I, to I, answer I can help that you because question, I had, I had right? the perfect guy to answer the question here with us. <laughs> Alexander, you. all the way from ACM Coatings. Alexander Tele, how, good afternoon first. Good afternoon. So here we're talking about black coatings and I have you in the room, my expert on black coatings. Uh, what is the, the challenge, the, the sweet spot, the unique selling point of your coatings in this head of displays business? Well, the unique selling point is that uh, our black uh, coatings uh, do not only work in the visible, but also in UV and infrared. We had already uh, talked about uh, other uh, infrared uh, applications uh, today. Uh, and those coatings are uh, inorganic. So they bring uh, exceptional um, resistance um, to, the, uh, to the system, uh, especially in regards of the temperature stability and stability um, against uh, sunlight. So um, we have already heard that there are uh, some developments around um, anti-reflective coatings. We do quite uh, kind of the opposite. So if you have mechanical components, housings, uh, apertures uh, that uh, need to absorb light, this is where our uh, black coatings, our actor coatings uh, are being applied to. When it comes to the automotive sector, because at the end of the day, this is one of the key applications we want to target. What is the, the, the readiness level? What kind of success stories could you maybe share with us? Uh, well, we are looking into different uh, applications in the automotive. We are uh, already far ahead uh, in also in serial production when it comes to sensors. So this is um, um, mainly uh, near infrared uh, sensors like uh, leader systems and, and camera systems like that. Um, this is uh, where we are performing very well. We are also looking into head up displays where uh, always a challenge because the parts are quite big in comparison to sensor elements. And with a, a vacuum deposition technology, you're kind of limited um, with the coding chamber. So uh, pricing, price point price point is uh, they are a challenge. I'm curious about applications for black coatings. So I would like to ask our optics manufacturers in the room. Uh, maybe I'm going to ask Jessica de Grote Nelson from Optimax. I know that at the, at the end they have been they have been looking at mental reality, virtual reality, defense applications, space applications. Jessica, black coatings. What is the the, the have you seen any challenges in the industry in which there could be some unique selling points on black coatings? Uh, so I, I, I'm afraid that we don't see a lot of requests for, for black coatings. Uh, and so I, I'm partially because that's not a, a current service that we offer, but it, it's good to know uh, what vendors are. So when we do see them, I'd be happy to, to reach out. So. Jessica, do me a favor. From today yeah. on, you offer black coatings with a collaboration with ACM Coatings. That's easy for me to arrange. <laughs> uh, so yes, yeah, so the next time we, we get a request, I'll, I'll be sure to, to, that we reach out. Yes. Yes, yes. Thank, thank you very much for that. And I love Jessica, that's why I can jump with her like this. But I also would like, would like to, to ask uh, Pia, Pia from Dispelix. Uh, just before we close the meeting, I am very interested to know about how you see the, the way guide technology developing, because we talk a bit about the holographic, we talk about the meta lenses. We'd like to hear a bit of how see the, the way guide technology developing in the head of display market. You say that it is possible to scale it to make larger optics. Uh, how do you see this market going? I'm so, so still so new with the display uh, but uh, let me just say in general, I think in 
you know, it's all about uh, based on what type of design approach you take. Um, you need all, you always need the light. You need the optics that match with the with your source, and then you design a, accordingly. So, um, I think there was also mentioned earlier today that the waveguides. I think it was Matthias, you who said that that's the waveguides are some of the key te key technologies. They're very challenging, um, but those are those are the kind of uh, the key components to to bring this new new technology AR um, you know ahead but definitely I see I see that this is the future this we, we have reached the amazing point in which I would like to ask everyone if they have a final question comment suggestion or room for cooperation I'm going to make a countdown but in the meantime when I make the countdown in my head I'm going to show you this slide during the meeting during the meeting, I was collecting challenges, ideas, and I did realize, first of all, uh, Modersohn came up with a very open challenge, the thin material, the thin film material to filter the, from the UV all the way to the infrared, any wavelength below one micron, uh, has to be reliable, it has to be suitable to production. Mega One and ST Microelectronics, they both want to start a collaboration with a re re robust, reliable MEM scanner on chip, suitable to large production with low cost. They are, of course, we scouted documented, but I know there are many other evaluations in the room. I would love to start more and more cooperation with ST Microelectronics. The start of the show today was the company MV6. They are looking to start new cooperations with laser diodes in RGB sector, in the RGB wavelengths, DOEs and light guys, polarizers, small DC motors, and they also want to start a new way of accessing this through the fabulous pilot line. So on that, I think lots of room for cooperation has been started. I also want to say that in this meeting, we started something that is going to be very big in the coming year. You're going to hear the word meta lenses a lot, a lot in the epic events. Remember it. When nobody was talking about meta lenses three years ago, we brought it to a meeting, we started pushing. Now Samsung is talking about it. It's gonna here, it's gonna come here to stay. And I would love the technology of these Pelix, Wave Optics, NILT. If you're looking for a technology to invest, look at meta lenses. And with this, I would like to say to all of you, to all of you, thank you so much. We built a shed with and that concludes the public part of today's meeting. If you are in our Zoom room, our informal private discussion is about to start. I call it virtual drinks with friends. And we all know follow-up is important. But for now, if you are watching on YouTube, that's where we leave you for today. Thanks to the Epic Production crew and all the sponsors for making today's event possible. More details about upcoming meetings are on our website. And if you want to get in touch with any of the participants, all you have to do is contact me directly and I will make sure you get introduced. It is all about connections. Thanks for being Epic. Okay, we are no longer live in YouTube. I can I always love saying that. We are no longer live in YouTube, so I can undo my tie. It's sunny in North. I